Now, very happy to say, to look back on this rather strange and hopefully unique year, we are joined by Philippe Beauclair. Philippe, hello. Hello to you. I really do hope this has been a u unique year in our lives. I can't face another one. Not yet. Not now. No, 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 no. So... Uh, it can only get worse, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> So it's that time of year, I guess, where we look back and uh, we asked you to pick out a few things which uh, struck you or uh, caused mm. you happiness or caused you dismay or sadness or any of the other emotions that football tends to bring. So the floor is yours. I have the list you sent on. So uh, we can start anywhere you like. I mean, you mentioned a few things, a number of uh, passings, some big names yeah. uh, passed on. There's uh, French football in a bit of trouble. Good news stories include Bielsa, Lewandowski. You've picked your teams of the year. And then, um, you know, one thing, actually, I had forgotten this, you know, when we're thinking about the year that was, and not many people will mention this. So let me mention it before okay. I hand over to you totally, and then I'll follow your lead. Go on. UEFA and Man City and CAS and financial uh, fair play. This, you know, this was the year where we thought, okay, a big name is going to get its comeuppance. Yeah. And um, I mean, I, di I did pieces on this. I may well have spoken to you at the time, and I I've completely forgotten already. I know, and, and the extraordinary thing as well is that when, you know, the non-event happened, as in Cass said, oh, guys, you waited too long to file this. Oh, there's a statute of limitation, so we can't deal with it. Oh, oh, really, all this for nothing. It was in July. I mean, that's the thing, is that it was July. It's less than six months ago. It feels like it was a lifetime ago that this happened. But yes, you're quite right. And I, I think it was actually one of the major events on a global scale uh, in, in certainly in uh, football governance, because um, the paper tiger had roared basically and had been scrunched by a few lawyers and been thrown in the bin. And uh, you're wondering after what happened with PSG in the past, what's happened with Man City, um, just exactly where this financial fair play did you do is going to go because to be honest i think that when it comes to the substance of the case actually how as was shown afterwards as well there was certainly a lot for manchester city to answer for but you know the law is the law and you if i didn't prepare its case properly or didn't look in it carefully enough and they got away with it and and um, also, Nasser Al Halafi of PSG got away with it. Remember, you had this um, court case in Switzerland with the former Secretary General of FIFA, uh, Jerome Valk, and for the same, for a similar reason, you know, he got off. Um, so it's been a strange year in that. Yeah, I, I'd almost, I'd forgotten myself about it, <laughs> like you, up until like, oh, you know, a light on the other side, the other aisle of the manor house where I live in comfort, paid by football magazines, um, a, a light was switched on and thought, yes, Manchester City, we'd completely forgotten about this one. I'm sure we'll, you know, I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll forget about about a hundred dozen other things because I think we've lost track of time. I think we've lost track of what a month is, a week is, a season is. But, you know, we'll give it our best shot. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and actually, to give a best shot to 2020 is exactly what I want to do. I want, to, I want 2020 to get shot off, really. <laughs> <laughs> and to jog people's memories, because we all had a lot going on this year, the cast Manchester City situation, it was actually quite simple. You know, we had anticipated this would be legal jargon and this would be a really yep. del delicate, nuanced, tricky case. But to put it in layman's terms, it was almost as simple as the Court of Arbitration for Sports saying to UEFA, you know, you've got a pretty good case here, but actually you've missed the deadline to file the case. So finito over Man City, off you go. That's kind of the gist here. It's not actually more, much more complicated than that. Um, to be honest, it was, it, it was very much the, <laughs> the gist of it, uh, astonishingly enough. And I think that what was really surprising is that some of my good friends who have, had followed this story and actually had been part of the story for, for quite a while, um, nobody had seen it coming. And afterwards, we were talking to each other, thinking, come on, we should have predicted this. We, we should have seen that there was a problem with the time limit, because usually we see these sort of things. And I think we saw, we were blinded by what we thought was the uh, hugeness of the case, because obviously we were expecting something like, okay, the two-season ban is going to cut to one, 
something like that, which is already going to be very interesting. Because remember at the time, it was, we were, remember what Kevin De Bruyne was saying at the time. He was saying, well, if it's one year, that's OK. If it's two years, that might be a bit of a problem. You were thinking, oh, gosh, what about Pep Guardiola as well? I mean, is he going to stay in a club uh, which is not in the chair? And all this for nothing. Poof. Nothing happened. Yes. Pff. Yeah. Exactly. And they both signed contract extensions in, in the last couple of weeks, De Bruyne yeah. just uh, today. So a, a final point on that then, is, is your sense that this uh, means financial fair play is, is somewhat dead in the water? Or because it was such a simple cock up on UEFA's part, will it just be a simple case of, well, next time let's make damn sure to hit the deadline and so financial fair play still has teeth? Well, the problem is that what the case of Manchester City uh, related to events which obviously took place quite a while ago, four or five years ago. Clubs have wised up to financial fair play in a way that they hadn't at the time, perhaps. I think the uh, mechanics and the processes they're using to be, you know, within, within the parameters defined by financial fair play are much more subtle. And the other thing you've got to think about is that financial fair play is somewhere in a bin being transferred to, um, you know, some kind of hole in the ground because of the pandemic, because UEFA obviously had to change all the rules. And uh, for how long, we don't know. But basically, the, the regulations which were in place have been, there's a kind of stay of execution in a way. They've been pushed back, you know, we'll be uh, talking about two seasons in one. We're basically delaying everything. We're, um, whether talking we being UEFA, we're basically allowing clubs to have investment uh, coming in, which will compensate for the losses created by coronavirus. And in which case we're talking about tens and hundreds of millions in, in some of the bigger clubs, which means it's going to be totally impossible to, I mean, those, those years, these years, those COVID years are going to be, I think, I'm afraid a free for all for some. Uh, there'll be plenty of ways to, to go around and to explain that, well, we had to put this money in because this, because that, because we lost $120 million of pounds or euros on, in ticket sales. We have to do this. So therefore we are having money taken in, uh, bringing, brought in by our investors, our owners, and it would be perfectly legit, which by the way, is normal. You don't want the clubs to, to go bankrupt. And, and, but this means that already the financial fair play process was in jeopardy. And I think with COVID, we can look at a completely new set of rules coming in, you know, in, you know, in a couple of years time or something like that. But no, the current system is, um, is shot. Mm. Uh, you jotted down in your message, Lewandowski. We should touch on Lewandowski. Yeah. Well, I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a member, I've been a member of uh, the, um, uh, the sports desk of France football for, for a very long time. I mean, 20, 22, oh God, it's nearly 22 years now. And <laughs> so we are the Ballon d'Or magazine. So we do not choose the Ballon d'Or, but we organize the, uh, the vote. And this year, the decision was taken uh, not to have a Ballon d'Or because um, we thought it would be unfair. Some competitions stopped, some leagues stopped, like, for example, the French league stopped for good. Uh, the Dutch league stopped, the Belgian league stopped. So, well, you've got to be, it's got to be fair. So you cannot judge players fairly if some of them could do their job and others couldn't, which seems like a good explanation to me and a good justification. But if I were Robert Lewandowski, I would feel very, very disappointed. He's not, quite clearly, he's not... Um, somebody who holds a grudge because he's given us a big interview for our last <laughs> edition of the year. It's a kind of honorary Ballon d'Or, but basically he would have had it. It's, it's actually, and he would have been a magnificent Ballon d'Or as well, and, um, and, and a proper Ballon d'Or, like not a super mega star, you know, who, uh, who is as well known by non-football fans as he is by football fans, but somebody who has reached a peak uh, late in his career, as actually quite a few centre forwards have done in the past, and um, has shown that he was able to almost reinvent himself to be that he was able to tailor his game to the needs and of various managers who have quite different ideas as to which tactics they should be using. Well, he's smart, he's absolutely lethal with left right foot header. Um, 
He is also built, I don't know, out of concrete. This man is almost never injured, um, has huge physical presence. His movement is better than ever. His sense of um, where to be in the box to create the most danger is as acute as ever, probably more acute than ever. He is one of the most complete, I mean, he's the most complete center forward we have in the world at the moment. And he was it, he was a shoe in honestly, for the Ballon d'Or. So I feel, I feel quite sorry for him. And also I feel quite sorry because it would have been a way to also through him um, reward an absolutely magnificent team, which nobody was expecting to be at this level throughout. And um, of which he's been one of the of the symbols, uh, you know, along with Thomas Müller or Serge Gnabry at, at, at other, or Joshua Kimmich, of course, and others. But he was really the, uh, I don't know, I mean, he's, uh, it, it, one, it was one of those years when you saw that Bayern were leading 3-1 somewhere say so, oh two of those goals are by Lewandowski <laughs> and sure enough they were yes I've yes. actually lost count of how many goals is he at at the moment you have his stats for the year I mean it's just prodigious it's it defies and and please let people should say oh it's only the Bundesliga where the defenses are not very good my goodness he scored in every competition he's just uh, yeah at the top absolute mm. top of his game and who cares if he does some silly dance moves and things like that? We, we don't care about that. Well, their demolition, Bayern's demolition of uh, clearly flailing Barcelona was one of the more thrilling nights, you know, one of the more thrilling yes. uh, stories of the year. It was incredible. So who is your team of the year then? Well, funny enough, you've just mentioned its name and it's not Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, a fight between, uh, between obviously Liverpool um, for domestic reasons and Bayern Munich. But if you look at the greater scheme of things, um, I would say Liverpool were my favourite for the title at the beginning of the 2019-2020 season, a long time ago. They were my favourite. Um, Bayern certainly were not my favourite for, for anything. They were in a very strange place where they had named uh, a manager who had been basically an assistant to kind of Mikel Arteta all through his life. I exaggerate when I say that. But is the guy that we knew, we knew his face, oh, we, we've seen this face before. Oh, yes, we saw him next, sitting next to Joachim Löw on, on, on the German uh, you know, bench. And, and you thought, you know, let's remember what we were saying about Bayern Munich at the time. We thought that they were an aging team, that there was on one hand very young players and, and age, you know, older players, that there was a gap in there somewhere. We thought that quite a few of them were past their best. Uh, we thought that there was genuine unrest within the dressing room, that some people were a bit too big for their boots, which is a bit typical for FC Bayern. Uh, we had questions about Lewandowski, how long can he carry on like that? Thomas Müller, is he finished? Mm -hmm. uh, you can carry on like that. People were questioning the recruitment. Um, and, and nobody could foresee that they would have a season like the season they had, playing the kind of football they had, which was absolutely thrilling, which is also the other thing. We used to a Bayern that surprises us from time to time and wins everything in sight. Can you remember as thrilling a, a Bayern side as this one? Mm. I can't. I genuinely can't. And I, I've been thinking about it. And uh, the, the, the Guardiola side was very, very good, but sort of just failed short in Europe, certainly, and didn't quite have the same thrilling, um, risk-taking approach. Um, the the Heinkes uh, team was was great to watch and had some, some superb player, but didn't quite have the same intensity. And again, the same, it didn't give the same thrill, which, you know, we talk about the demolition of Barcelona. I would say that the demolition of PSG, even though the scoreline is not the score of a demolition, was even more thrilling because you think, how on earth can you accept taking such risks all the mm. time mm. against some of the best forwards on the planet, or so we are told? And they did it. And they believed in it. They went through it and they won. And yes. there was no doubt about it at all. So for the results, for the surprise, for the quality of the play, and for some exceptional players, and Seguel Cantara, how did, can I not mention him? Um, but especially, I mean, my favorite, I mean, my favorite, one of my pet, pet footballers, uh, Thomas Müller. It's just so wonderful to see this. Mm. Yes.
they Gee, were dev- sort of, he's a genius. He's, he's a genius he's, in a different different way. He's a, yeah. yeah, he belongs to a different dimension. He's not a normal footballer. He doesn't look like a footballer. He doesn't play football like a footballer. No. Technically, he's not the best player. Physically, he's certainly not the strongest player. He's probably, is he the most intelligent player there's ever been? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's just he's pure football. So yeah. um, it was thrilling to see him being rewarded as well. So, you know, FC Bayern, Good on my. That's. Uh, I hope Raphael Honigstein is listening to this. He's going to he's going to be incapable to contain himself. Listen to me uh, <laughs> thinking about his team like that. <laughs> I only hope we get Liverpool back to the peak of their powers, playing that thrilling brand of football, and Bayern still playing that thrilling brand of football. And you know what? You'd say you'd like it in the final. I'll take it over two legs. I want two helpings of it. That'd be something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and with no extra time, no penalties, so there has to be replays. Yeah, absolutely. That's, it's, a, it's a game I could watch every week for a couple of years. I think so. It might be a very cagey game for all I know because... I have my doubts. Yeah, I have my doubts too. I'm just saying that just there. But it would be, this, let's be fair, it would be absolutely wonderful to have two of the dominating teams of their, of their year. Now the question is, can they be the dominating teams of our era? Is the question that you've mm. got to ask yourself. And in the case of, of Liverpool, uh, which, of course, is silver medal in this particular um, um, you know, awards ceremony, um, is that they seem to have an act to buy the right players at the right price at the right time to replace. They seem to have this capacity to uh, compensate for... I mean, I'm astonished what they're doing at the moment, you know, and not having their captain, who was supposed to be exceptional, uh, who is exceptional. It's not supposed to be he's exceptional. And, and, and the thing I thought as well is that when they lost Virgil van Dijk, I thought, oh dear. But I thought, okay, that might be a chance for Thiago Alcantara to, <laughs> because Virgil van Dijk in a way is a quarterback. And a lot of the play of Liverpool was Virgil van Dijk just like bringing the ball five yards ahead of him and then pinging those 50 yards passes to Alexander Arnold, Robertson, Mane, Salah, whoever, with unerring precision, Ala Beckenbauer. Now I was thinking if they, if they don't have him, None of the other centre backs that Liverpool has has the same capacity to find teammates with such unerring accuracy. But they've got Thiago, so which means now that they've got one of the supreme passers in the in the game, they will go through him. So Liverpool is going to play a shorter kind of game because before that, with Virgil Van Dijk, they were, I think, on average, uh, the team which played the most long passes in the Premier League, and uh, and they lose Thiago. <laughs> mm, mm. Then you think, okay, well, they've got Jota, he's scoring all these goals. Oh, then they lose Jota. You think that, how do you deal with this? And you produce not just these results, but this quality of play. That you were able to scrap results despite playing badly is something that they've done for two years already. Mm. But being able to produce that kind of, of football, which we saw again recently with Minamino starting, Oxley Chamberlain coming back, Mo Salah on the bench. Wow, yeah, it's astonishing. And to and if we could see those two, you know, that together would be brilliant. And again, yes, it, is it the beginning of an era of dominance by by those two? I think it's a bit more of a problem of renewal for Bayern that perhaps there is for uh, for 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 Liverpool. We'll see. I mean, you know, they're they're quite clever as well in the way they they recruit their players, but they do need to look at they need a few maybe younger players in defence in particular. And Lewandowski is not eternal. I hope you prove me wrong on that, but I don't think he is. If you're just tuning in, we are chatting with Philippe Beauclair, regular voice in the show over the year, about the year that was. So we have touched on the uh, debacle of UEFA at CAS in the Manchester City case. Bayern and Liverpool are teams of the year in uh, Philippe's uh, view, Bayern by a nose. Lewandowski, the Ballon d'Or winner that wasn't. Yeah. So uh, quite a few um, departures, as there is every year. I mean, that's the nature of uh, life, I suppose. And increasingly, more and more people were famous uh, from TV. So just more and more famous people yes. are going to die, I suspect. Uh, so the ones which kind of made an impact over here, you sent a lengthy list, actually. But uh, ones which yeah. registered here were Julia and Maradona, of course. Jack Charlton was big uh, during the summer here for obvious reasons. Paolo Rossi, Nobby Styles. Any of uh, those departures or others uh, have a profound effect on you or strike you for any reason, Philippe? Well, I mean, two, two of, of the people um, I, I, I mentioned when I was talking to, uh, to our friend JP before, before the show were, were people who were friends of mine. So obviously, yes, I have um, very, uh, 
that's one of the reasons why I hate this year. I mean, um, Jarouillet was somebody that I, somebody whom I, I, I had a lot of um, affection, love, even, and respect for. Who Who's that, for... Philippe? Sorry. Gerard. Gerard Oh, Gerard Houllier. Sorry. My, uh, my, my, my uh, uncultured Irish ear uh, misheard your Gerard uh, quite badly. So, Thank Gerard. You. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, I'm with you now, Gerard. Yes. So, and but also his his former um, uh, assistant Jacques Croisier was a, an absolutely delightful man and a very good friend. So, yes, it's been uh, it's been in a way before their time. And then, yeah, you can carry on like that. I mean, um, could, I, could I ask you on yeah. Julier, on Julier Philippe? Uh, we all knew how ill he was, obviously from his Liverpool days and taken ill at half time. And I think he actually did potentially die. Um, on the surgery table and, and made a great recovery. Yeah, I, was the Gerard Houllier's sense that he was always on borrowed time after that? Did he did he live with that weight or that that ticking clock over his shoulder? Do you know? I think that he was aware of it that he cheated death in a way. I know that um, a few of his close friends, like Phil Thompson, for example, um, had talked to him about that. Specifically, I never broached the subject directly with Gerard, um, but yes, of course, and and he had been frail for a while. I mean, it's not something he, he never fully recovered. Um, you know, the comeback against Roma, the famous comeback against Roma, the the hug with Fabio Capello and Liverpool winning two nil, uh, an extraordinary story, but a story which perhaps was um, was not the right one. It should have waited a bit longer. Um, there were doubts. I think he asked himself the question whether he had done the right thing going to Villa, not because he didn't enjoy his time there or, or, or like the people he met there, not at all, but because for health reasons. And 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 in his health had been declining, you know, uh, over the years. But uh, you know, I I saw him in London not that long ago, and um, with his wife Isabel, and he was uh, he was yes tired. Uh, he was showing his age, but you know, he still, it was, you know, it was, it was still, there was no sign that, you know, he was in a really bad way. But unfortunately, you know, the last operation was, was the fatal one. So, yes, I mean, I, 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 I he probably knew he was a very incredibly sensitive man, hypersensitive even, um, and obviously a very, very smart, intelligent man. He knew, he knew that, um, he cheated death. He knew that he was, and but like all of us, that he was, um, you know, we say en sursis in, in French, an expression which doesn't have a real ready translation. We're basically in the antechamber all the time. But um, and he knew it perhaps better than others. But um, what a what a fantastic life he had, and mm. uh, that's which is the consolation is that he knew how cherished he was. He knew how loved he was. Uh, he achieved an awful lot in his career with things that he would never have dreamt of when he was, you know, a young teacher spending a, a year in all sub com comprehensive teaching football and seeing his first Liverpool game. And uh, France was became a world champion in part thanks to him, to his work in the, in the background. He made Liverpool, well, be Liverpool again and kick-started the, the renaissance of the club. And he did so many other things as well. So he was a French champion with PSG. Um, and a different PSG. So, and especially, um, you've heard all the um, tributes that were paid to him. And I can tell you, all of them were sincere. And uh, to deserve to be um, to deserve such tributes, you have to be an exceptional man. And he was an exceptional man. Mm. We'll miss him. I'll miss him a great deal. I can tell you that. Mm. And uh, it's 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 been. I mean. I've, it seems like also it's not just like football people who've left, but also very good football people. Michel Hidalgo was was a wonderful man who took France to you know he was the manager of the great eighty two team, eighty four team, eighty six team. Robert Herbin, who was one of the quite extraordinary character, um, former Saint Etienne player and, and manager, a great lover of classical music, quite quite a guy. Bruno Martini, the the, the French keeper was also very much loved uh, within French football. Papa Bouba Diop, perhaps the saddest story of them all. I mean, to think that such a magnificent footballer 
could fall the victim of this awful disease and, and, and die so young. And, and then we can carry on. As I see in Nobby Styles, of course, Hans Tilkowski, uh, Alejandro Sabella, Paolo Rossi. I mean, and Robbie Rensenbrink, who was one of my childhood heroes. So that's, it's been an absolutely awful year. And to be honest, I don't think I can remember one in which, I mean, there have been years of disasters and years of tragedies when, like 1958, or when, when a, a single catastrophe has, uh, has you know, brought the whole football family to its knees, so to speak, or the crash of the Zambian national team airplane, things like This is different. This is like it felt like it was hitting left, right, and center. Mm. And hitting where it hurts the most, and um, and I'm, pro I'm I'm forgetting a few names obviously, but I think very few of our clubs and national teams have been spared um, by the, the grim the very grim reaper in 2020. There you go, and of course Diego. But what can we say about that? Well, yeah, not much to add there. No. Uh, so before the clock comes too much against us, you had, uh, I'll, I'll let you choose what you want to touch on here. You had mentioned that uh, given the uh, media pro situation, the uh, money and friend, uh, TV, uh, the, the French League is potentially in trouble. You had mentioned Bielsa and Leeds yeah. and uh, you'd mentioned PSG. So where, 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 what do you want to go to? Well, I think perhaps we should be a little bit more, uh, you know, finish on that, on, on us up a little bit yes there's, there's, there's people driving home for christmas as they listen or else uh, unfortunately uh, driving I mean, home to lockdown French football is on the edge of a precipice that's a fact we'll talk about it later mm. um psg being psg is almost funny in some ways um but uh, i think the, the feel-good story um regardless you're you like leeds united or not um and I would imagine quite a few people are not so fond of Leeds United as a club. <laughs> Don't know why. Hmm. But my goodness, uh, he's done it again. That's, that's, that's what you can say. He's done it again. And um, how he does it, uh, nobody knows. It's not spying on Derby County, which is giving his players, players like Hugh Dallas or Luke Ayling, who are suddenly playing like Cafu and Roberto Carlos, uh, or Jack Harrison, who is just, I don't know, I absolutely love him. And nobody whacks the ball harder than Jack Harrison. I don't know why. He just loves to whack it. Even when he's crossing, he loves to whack it. And I love a whacked ball. Mm -hmm. um, and you look, and there's so much invention in there. Um, Rafinha was a great catch, by the way. I thought that was a really, really good one to get. But they've been... You know, Leeds had tried other ways to to go up, get back to the big time, and had failed. And and it's worked with a manager who is a risk taker. And I know there's been a debate, if you can call that a debate, um, argument rather, raging on Twitter about would you have Bielsa as your manager? And my answer is, of course, it's because it's exactly what I, why I'm a football fan. I don't know what to expect, but I can expect the best. That's the thing. I know the best is possible. I can also get thrashed 6-2 and, you know, and being led, you know, 6-1 and still going for the goal, which they got. Um, and this is beautiful. And, and to see, I think part of the pleasure for me is to see, um, what's the word? Uh, not a, a validation, perhaps even that, of Bielsa's football in an English context is a wonderful thing because People always say the same thing about Bielsa. They always say that uh, the gold medal with the Argentinian team really doesn't matter. The titles in Argentina, pff, who cares? And actually, he didn't achieve much. You know, if you know his teams, his Chile team was great, but did this? His athletic team was great, but failed, and ultimately failed, and so forth. And you think, well, yes, yes, but no, because look at what he's been working with, and he carries on doing that, and 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 suddenly brings back. And that's the one thing I'm happy that is at least because of the white shirt. This is a football which is made to be played in white shirts. Mm. I mean, could you imagine, and nobody's done it yet, could you imagine around Madrid with the players they've got having a Piazza at their head? Mm. It would sort them out PDQ, I would imagine. Um, even put him, you know, I don't, I don't know, put him with any team, it would be great fun. Put him with Arsenal, you wouldn't recognize Arsenal within two weeks. 
So it's it's great um, for for people like me who've always well, always have admired him for a very long time. It's been a marvelous um, validation of of his philosophy and the fact it can be successful. Uh, how it's going to end, we don't know. But one thing is sure is that Leeds were not in as good a place as they are now when he arrived at the club. And that when he arrived at the club, remember how people said that it would self-combust. You know, remember how people, even in the promotion season, were saying, because there was they always hit the wall at one point, and they did hit a wall, or we thought they'd hit the wall. And people were starting to say, oh, look at Bielsa, always the same thing. Two-thirds of the season is fantastic. Last third, they're on their knees. They can't, yeah. No, they got it. They went past the line. And they're really bringing so much to the table. Um, I hope they they stay sat at it for a very long time. And I, I hope that, you know, he stays around and and perhaps get a, gets a chance at, um, at a really big club. But maybe, you know, um, I should stop because he, when I started with Bielsa, I could carry on for, forever. <laughs> but in a way, the kind of football which he uh, asks his team to play in which the sense of sacrifice is is huge. You've got to run yourself into the ground for your partners and your teammates. And there are no exceptions to that. If you don't do it, you won't be in the team, no doubt. Mm -hmm. But the players believe it. Now, could it work with a squad of players who are much more, um, shall we say, sure of their ways? Who are not like Ailing and Dallas coming from a fairly modest football background or even Harrison, actually. I, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe it wouldn't work. I mean, Klopp is doing something of, of the kind, playing a, not as it, it's incredible. Klopp cannot actually match the intensity of Bielsa's football. Yeah. Um, but he's doing something of the kind, so it's possible. But you need to be an extra special man manager, ex, extra special manager, full stop. Mm. But in any case, let's enjoy it while while we can. Um, there haven't been many things to be uh, happy about in 2020, but this was definitely one of them. Long way to continue. Yeah, for sure. It's amazing. So, um, well, let's, before I, I, I bid you farewell and wish you a happy Christmas, to ask the most cliched of questions. And I suspect every radio show you listen to for the next week or so will be doing something similar. But uh, I am curious, Philippe Claire, what has living through this year uh, done to you? In what way has it impacted you? If at all, maybe it hasn't changed you well, at all. It's we, changed we, an awful lot. Uh, it? okay. it's, it's, had, it's been... Um, the thing, you know, everybody will have, I mean, there are people who are, have had a far tougher year than me, tens of thousands of people in, in the country where I live, who've lost people who are part of their family. But I lost, uh, I lost a number of friends this year. This, so it's been, uh, and young friends sometimes. So it's been, I mean, I'll use the way it's been a shit year and I can't wait for it to be over. And I wish us all good luck, basically. <laughs>